So, and here's the topics that we're going to talk about um, just in general. And I will let Lydia start it off with lesson seven for common distributions here. All right, hello everyone. Um, we're gonna start with, I'm just gonna start with lesson seven and then Anne-Marie is gonna do the rest of the um, review. So lesson seven was about common distributions. And first thing I'm gonna talk about is binomial random variables, which here's just a definition for it, is a spe specific type of a uh, random variable that counts how often a particular event occurs in a fixed number of tries or trials. So for a variable to be considered a binomial random variable, it must meet all three of these conditions. So there must be a fixed number of trials or a fixed sample size. The probability of success uh, must be the same for each trial and the trials are independent of each other. Um, an example I like to use for this is the number of heads or tails when you flip a coin, uh, say a hundred times. So if you go through each condition, there's a fixed sample size of a hundred times. The probability of success is the same for each trial, which is 0.5. And the trials are independent of each other and because they're not dependent on one another. So next is the central limit theorem, which Basically, the definition is just that if a sample size is sufficiently large enough, let's say C n equals 30, then the distribution should be approximately normal, which is the bell-shaped symmetrical curve. So yeah, that's pretty much all you need to know for that. And here's just some formulas to compute the mean and standard deviation. So the mean of a binomial random variable is the, uh, the mean equals the sample size times the probability of success. Um, this is also known as the expected value. And the standard deviation of a binomial random variable is the square root of the sample size times the probability of success times one minus that probability as well. So in the next slide, there's gonna be just to compute, uh, just asking you guys to compute the probability of success and the standard deviation given um, the sample size of 15 and the mean of eight. So you guys can work on that for a few minutes, type your answers into the chat box, and then I'll go over that. All right, so if you're still working, that's okay. I'm just gonna go over this just to kind of speed things along. Hopefully 
if you don't get it, you'll I'll hopefully make it easier for you. But first, we're going to find the probability of success, which in the previous slide, the formula was given that mu equals n times p. So we are given the sample size and the mean here. So we're just looking to find the probability of success. So it'll come out to be 8 equals 15 times p. And then all you have to do is divide 8 by 15. And you should get 0.53 as your probability. So next you want to compute the standard deviation and you can use that p that you just found. It'll make the formula uh, way easier. Uh, so it'll be standard deviation equals square root of your sample size, which is 15, times p, which is 0.53 you just calculated times 1 minus p. So once you do all the multiplication out, it should come out to 7.95 times 0.47. And then you'll want to make sure that you take the square root of that answer don't forget to take the square root or else your answer will be bigger than bigger than it's supposed to be and once you take the square root it your final answer should come out to be 1.93 so if you didn't get that make sure you get those formulas down those are very useful to know for your exam and that's it thanks guys All right, yay, thank you, Lydia. That was a great review for lesson seven. Hopefully everyone is pretty clear on that one. That was our um, earliest one for the midterm here. So, and like Lydia said, definitely get a good grip on what those, um, what those equations are because they are useful when you're trying to find these. And it's really just um, uh, algebra when you have to do these. So uh, definitely try to understand them. All right, so I put chapters uh, eight and nine together because they're both talking about inferences for samples. Um, but we started out with inferences for one sample and then moved on for two samples. So just a review about when we have data from two groups, we have to understand either if they're independent or dependent. Um, this is an important uh, de like, de uh, like deviation to understand. So if they are independent, that means they're unrelated, they don't affect one another, while if they are dependent or paired, that means that they're matched to one another often. And um, if they are matched to one another, that means that what happens to one will affect the other. Um, so overall, we are going to have um, those, uh, they are gonna be dependent upon each other and we, those are often um, paired as well. All right, so let's try a review question for this one. So. Um, this has to do with what we just went over. So our research question is, in fraternal twins, where one baby is male and one baby is female, do the brothers tend to weigh more than the sisters at birth? So our design is that we have a random sample of 30 pairs of twins, and then each baby is weighed. For each set of babies, the weight of the female is subtracted from the weight of the male. So are the data that we have independent or paired? So go ahead and answer these, and then please type your answer into the chat box, and then we will go ahead over that one. Okay, good job, guys. Yeah, so the answer to this would be paired. Um, so remember, for and paired is another way that we can say um, dependent. So basically, let me circle here. So we're talking about paired. So remember, this is the same thing as dependent. Um, 
So that means that what happens to one group will affect the other one. So in this case, if, um, you know, if the, for the, each pair, you know, if a male, if the male's weight changes, that means that um, the data that you get is going to change because um, when you subtract the two, your end result is going to be different. So, and also it's talking about, you know, twins. So basically, you know, that does depend upon the two and then, you know, what they weigh. And if one changes, that does affect the outcome of your, um, you know, trying to find the differences of it. So that that's why we um, call these independent, or excuse me, that's why we call them dependent <laughs> or paired. So good job, guys. You definitely understand that one. All right, let's keep cruising. So um, we have a rule of sample proportions, which Lydia told us about the um, central limit theorem. And this is basically the central limit theorem except for proportions. And it's pretty self-explanatory in the title. It's our rule of sample proportions. So all it's saying is that when you have your sampling distribution and um, you want to try to decide if you can use it to estimate P, um, then, you know, this, these are kind of like the rules that have to be followed in order to do that. So um, basically n times p has to be at least 10, so your sample size times your probability, and then also n times 1 minus p, so n times 1 minus your probability also has to be 10, at least 10. And um, if this is true, then we can use our sampling distribution to estimate our um, p, which is our population parameter there. And um, so then, then over here, it is just talking about our, that our mean of our uh, p hat, so the mean of our uh, Popular or a sample proportion is going to be equal to if these are are met if these conditions are met is going to be equal to our population parameter um, so our population proportion there and then we have our standard deviation down here and this is just the equation used to find that and um, in terms of our samples we do call it the standard error um, so yeah just keep in mind this is what we have uh, using our population parameters here um, population proportions for this equation here. Oops. Okay. All right. So now switching back to means, um, when we're talking about means, we, um, well, where I'm going to go over like the first two steps of hypothesis testing for these different ones, because uh, we want to keep in mind that, you know, our last three steps are basically the same for every hypothesis test. We're going to make sure that we um, check the sample, you know, we're going to find our, our test statistic P value based upon that and then make a decision on that. Um, and then a real world decision, you know, to put it into context. So for our first, for hypothesis testing for one mean, um, the assumptions that have to be met in the conditions are that we have to have quantitative data because remember for means we have to have quantitative data and it also has to be randomly sampled. And then if these are, and the population has to be approximately normally distributed because if it isn't, um, we can't use the hypothesis testing for a mean. And then once again, um, you know, and also, you know, we go more in depth into this table and, you know, all of these topics in the um, chapter reviews for the weeks that uh, you guys were having those lessons. But it's just an overview of basically you can find, you know, a contingency table that you can find, you know, the different, you know, alternative and null hypotheses that you would write and dependent on um, what research question you were using there. And then once again, our second step is going to be calculating that test statistic. And for means, we're going to be talking about our test statistic being T. And so we have our mean minus our null, um, or, so our sample mean minus our null um, population mean. And then our standard deviation, um, also our standard error of the sample is our denominator. So that's just um, how you would find that. It's just simple math there. And then to talk about hypothesis testing for paired means, so we were just talking about one mean, now we're gonna talk about two that are paired, so they're dependent upon each other. So basically the main assumption that has to be met is that they have to be paired, obviously, for us to use this. And then, so they have to be dependent on one another, which is opposite really from the last one. And then, um, because we were only talking about one mean, and then we also have to have our um, population be, or our sample be at least 30. Um, that goes back to our central limit theorem, because if they are that, then that means we have a big enough sample size to continue on um, and, you know, make inferences about our population based upon our samples. So once again, this is just a contingency table based upon what types of um, hypotheses you would write, um, dependent on what your general research question is. And that also tells you the type of hypothesis test there. 
And then we're still using T for our calcul or calculating our test statistic because T is what we correlate with um, our means. So, and this is just the equation here, same exact equation, really the same setup as we do for one mean, except the main difference is we have this subscript D down there. Um, so that is showing us that there is the difference in the sample means and then uh, the difference of um, means in our uh, standard error in the denominator. So that's the main difference here. We're still using the same setup that we have our sample here, standard error here, and null um, mean here, population mean, but other than that, you know, we just want to ensure that we're using the difference between the two means to, you know, create our, la our one number that we're going to use there. Okay, and then so hypothesis testing for two proportions, so two independent proportions, this means that they do not affect one another. And we talked about this in our rule of sample proportions that we do have to have um, a minimum of 10 successes and 10 failures in each group. And this is the same thing as, I lost my pen. I always lose my pen, send help. Um, okay, I guess I'm not gonna write. So <laughs> it's the same idea as having the n times p being our, um, th that's our successes, and then n times one minus p is our failures. So it's the same thing, just written differently. And so those are the assumptions that have to be made. And then, I really, I'm <laughs> struggling. Okay, so those are assumptions that have to be met. And then you can go ahead on with this um, this hypothesis test. So and it's just saying, you know, the same idea here, which hypothesis you would use dependent on what your research question is. And then the one thing to think about here is that our test statistics, since we're talking about proportions, is going to be Z. And then as you can see here, we are going to have our difference in sample proportions for each um, group here for one and two. And then our standard error of the null um, is going to be our denominator, which is a little bit different than mean, so keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, our test statistic for two independent proportions is going to be Z. Okay, and we talked about two independent means at first, um, but now we're gonna talk about, I'm sorry, we talked about two paired means before that were dependent on each other. Now we're gonna talk about hypothesis testing for two independent means, so, uh, so means that are don't affect one another. So remember our, our assumption that had to be met for our um, paired means is that they had to be paired. And then obviously, so for independent means, they have to be independent of one another. And same idea, we do have to have um, both of those samples have to be um, at least 30. Um, technically, it doesn't have to be if you have the population that's normally distributed, but if it's not, you have to make sure that those sample sizes are at least 30 to continue on and then write these null and alternative hypotheses and go on to the second step, which would be calculating your test statistics. So we're back to T because we're talking about means. And here, basically, this is the same idea that we had um, for, you know, one mean, but here we're going to have um, our numerator be involving the two sample means, the two different groups, and then our standard error of both groups um, is going to be on the denominator there. So main idea for when you have two different groups is that you want to ensure that you're using both of them in your um, for your test statistics so that they're you know both being uh, identified there. Okay. All right, so let's try a review question for this one. So based on a 2000 census, 31.8% um, of Penn State students have visited the creamery and at least five times in the past year. So suppose your sample size is 200 people and they're like they're to be sampled from this population. And the sample proportion of students who visited the creamery at least five times, which is your P hat, because um, it's a sample, so, and that's to be calculated. So what is the standard error for the sample proportion? Um, and just a hint there, you want to use that rule of sample proportions that we talked about earlier. Um, so look back in your notes if you need that. And so go ahead and solve this and please put your answer into the chat box for me.
Okay, awesome. Yeah, so our answer is going to be A here. So remember, um, in this case, since our rule of sample proportions um, says that we do have um, n times p and n times 1 minus p is at least 10, um, we can continue on and find the sample proportion. So um, here, the way that we find our sample proportion, um, I'm sorry, the way that we find our standard error in terms of the rule of sample proportions is to do the square root of our p times 1 minus p and then divided by n. So here we just do our square root of 0 0.318 and then times 1 minus 0 0.318. And then we divide that by n, which is our 200, which we get about 0 0.0329 for our answer. So that's why it is A. So the, basically the main idea of this one was to understand that this is the equation you would use um, in order to find that standard error of the sample portion. So I guess these should be p hat then too. So good job. All right, um, here's another one. So under all management, historical data show that 2% of customers felt that they received poor service at a restaurant. New management has taken over and the manager wants to see if improvements have been made. You are asked to analyze data from a random sample of 100 common cards to see if less than 2% of customers state that they received poor service during their visit. So which of the following statistical procedures that we've talked about should be used to answer this research question? So read through these and please type your answer in the chat box and then we will go over it. All right, great job, guys. Absolutely. So our answer here is going to be one sample proportion exact method. So, you know, the first thing we want to decide basically is, are we talking about proportions or means? So since we're talking about, it says 2% of customers, so that's going to be 0 0.02, which is going to be a proportion. And so we can cancel out any of them that say mean, because that's not, we know that that's not going to be it. So we would come down to these ones. So um, in this case, we want to decide, are we talking about one or two um, proportions? And in this case, it's all trying to talk about if less than 2% of the customers state that they receive poor service. So this is literally, this is just going to be um, one. This is going to be one proportion. So we can cancel out this one here. And then the main idea to come down to if we're using the exact method or the normal approximation method is to check um, our condition. So NP has to be at least 10. And then also n times 1 minus p also has to be at least 10. So in this case, np is actually going to be, you know, if we do 100, that's our sample size, um, times 0 0.02, it's actually only going to come out to 2. So we can honestly stop right there and be like, okay, that's not um, correct because this is not um, at least 10. So in that case, we do have to use the exact method um, for that reason, because you can use it if it's not, if these conditions aren't met here. So that's why your answer is that. So good job. That's a tricky one. Sometimes people struggle with that. So you guys did a good job with that. All right. So one more for this chapter, um, I think. Yeah. Um, so is the proportion of girls who like strawberry ice cream different than a proportion of boys who like strawberry ice cream? 
So in a sample of 40 girls, 27 liked ice, uh, strawberry ice cream, and then in a sample of 45 boys, 25% of them like strawberry ice cream. So what graph would you use to display this data? And then also a follow-up question, what test would you use to address this research question similar to the other one? So let me know what you think, and we will go over it. Great job, guys, absolutely. So our answer here, the first one is going to be A. And remember, because this kind of goes back um, to other things that we talked about earlier in the semester about um, what, what we, like types of data do we use to display. So remember, for categorical data, um, this is the only one, the cluster bar chart is the only one that uh, displays categorical data. Histograms and dot plots are both for quantitative data. And we're talking about, you know, our variable here is, um, you know, yes or no to strawberry ice cream. So that's going to be categorical. So our answer is A. And then for our second one, um, it's going to be two independent proportions, Z test. So um, basically, remember here, we have two different uh, proportions here. So we have the 27 out of 40 girls. And then if we talk about the boys, we have, no, just kidding, sorry. Yeah, no, that was right, sorry. And then for the boys, we have 25 out of 45 boys. So that's just gonna show those are our two different proportions. And they are gonna be independent because they don't affect one another. Um, so that's why they are going to be two independent proportions, Z tests there. So good job, you guys definitely understand that one. All right, so then a quick review of um, lesson 11 for one-way ANOVA. So, Common question about ANOVA is, you know, why wouldn't we use a bunch of t-tests? And basically, it's because we would have to do a lot of t-tests in order to find what we want to find about ANOVA, you know, if there is a difference between all the different um, means. So it would really be unproductive. And then it's kind of like when you're doing, if you're on a calculator and you're trying to find an answer and there's a bunch of steps and you keep rounding it, and then at the end, your answer is kind of different than it should be. Um, if you just want to use the right numbers, you know, without rounding it, it's the same idea here that if you did a bunch of t-tests, you are going to um, increase the chance of getting a type 1 error, which is our alpha, remember. And then also, in reality, since we're doing that, we aren't going to get uh, information about our independent variable overall. You know, we'll get a little bit from each uh, test, but not about it overall. So that's why we wouldn't do that in this case. And then, so just a review of what the hypothesis testing procedures should be for um, an ANOVA test. So the assumptions that have to be met are these first three here. So uh, each sample does have to be independent um, and has to be random. So this is a common thing that we usually, that you see often. And then the distribution does have to follow a normal distribution in order to use this. And then we do have to have a population variances to be equal across those levels there. And the way that you find to see if they're, um, and so making sure that those variances are equal for those responses, you can just um, compare the groups there and make sure that the lowest one, this, the smallest one divided by the largest one is at least two. And that'll um, make you decide that. And then lastly, our null and alternative hypotheses to write this. 
this is basically saying that there's no change um, for our null, that they are all the same, all of the means are equal, and then our alternative is obviously just saying that not all of them are equal, and that's going to say that there is some sort of change basically there. And this just means that at least one of them is not equal, so it's not a certain amount of them. As long as one, at least one is not equal, that's going to um, be satisfying our alternative hypothesis there. And then something a little bit different for ANOVA, our test statistic is an F statistic. We've been talking about T and Z earlier, but um, this one is going to be talking about an F st uh, statistic. And this one goes in, um, you get this from a mini tab output, and then based upon that F value, you are going to use um, to find your P value. So that's all that is. Um, Oh, and just about the F value, it is the variation um, between groups divided by the variation within the groups. Um, and it has to be a right tail probability. So those are just two um, comments about the F value there. So let's do one more review question about ANOVA. So we have a study compared testosterone levels among athletes in four sports, soccer, track, lacrosse, and water polo. The total sample size was N equals 30. Uh, so we had 10 soccer, 10 track, 5 lacrosse, and 5 water polo. A one-way analysis of variance was used to compare the population mean levels for the four sports. For the F test, P equals 0.02. And using alpha is 0.05, so that's our um, probability of a type 1 error. Um, what is our conclusion that we can make? So go ahead and read through these options and let me know what you think, and we'll go over it then. Yay, okay, great job. You guys are doing a great job. So definitely, so our answer here is going to be B. So in this case, we found that for our F test that our P is gonna be 0.02. So remember that if our P value is less than alpha, we're gonna be in favor of our alternative. Um, so in this case, our P value was 0.02, which was less than our alpha, which is 0.05. So this is alpha. Um, so in that case, we are able to reject our null hypothesis. So we can cancel out C and A because we are going to reject it. Um, but and then remember, our conclusions are always made about our population means or our population in terms of that. So we're, we use a bunch of samples to eventually make a conclusion about our population. So that's why it wouldn't be D because we're not talking about the sample. Our conclusion about the null is not about the sample. So that's that. All right, so that's all we got for tonight. Um, good luck on the midterm to everyone. And our next group review won't be till next Thursday um, because of midterms. So if you have any other questions, let me know. If not, if you haven't put your, um, yeah, if you haven't put your uh, email into the chat box, that would be awesome. And um, yeah, have a good week. Good luck. Enjoy everything. It's homecoming weekend. So yeah, super exciting.